Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us today at Skip's webinar on how will your competitor react? Getting inside your competitor's decision-making with the amazing Ken Potter and Nancy Potter of the Benning Group. My name is Aliyah Kennan. I am the Global Director of Education and Training for Skip. And since we may have several new members in the line, I'd like to do a brief introduction for Skip. Skip is a global community of intelligence strategists, leaders who use insight and best practices to help our organization increase revenues and risk strategy choices. We are a 35-year-old nonprofit of intelligence thought leaders, and we advance intelligence-driven strategies and outcomes through accredited training and certification. Today, I have the absolute amazing pleasure to introduce the amazing Kent and Nancy of the Benning Group. Ken has been with, has over 20 years of experience in strategy, planning, and consulting, and is the co-founder of the Benning Group. Nancy is also the co-founder of the Benning Group, and she works with the company to figure out where the market is going. Ken, Nancy, welcome. Thank you. I think first we should point out the difference. I'm Kent, and she's, the, <laughs> she's actually taller than I am in this video. She's actually a foot shorter than I am, almost, not quite, 10 inches. Okay, 10 inches shorter. I'm six, she's five two. But if I make her feel better by putting her on a stool, which she got the stool. A pedestal. Pedestal, she's, uh, she's on a pedestal. Yes. Then she absolutely. won't kick me because she's close enough to do that. <laughs> okay. Oh, so this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about who we are, not a sales pitch here, just who we are. Well, we might have to make it up. But anyway, <laughs> some objectives and takeaways that we hope you'll get out of this session. The point of this session is to give you stuff you can use, not stuff you have to come to us to use, but stuff you can use. Of course, if you want to hire us at some point, cool, but that's not the point, is it? The point is tools you can use. That's what we want to do. So we'll do these five things. I'm not a slide reader. If you want to take a screen capture, you can know where we are. Ta-da! Next. All right, this is us. We've been around for a while. We founded it, we're old. Are we old? We're really old. We founded it a long time ago. And we. I came from market research and well, is, is government intelligence research? Yes. Okay, I guess, I guess so. So, no, I was not a spy. I, I, no, I, I, was not a, I was not a spy. But in any case, we collected intelligence on behalf of the U.S. government. I did. Anyway, and we decided after we started the consultancy that the real killer app for competitive intelligence was influence, really understanding what made people tick and why they made the decisions they, they made so you could help convince them to change those choices and make the decisions you wanted them to make. So that's what we focused on, and that's what this is about. Understanding how a competitor will react to a decision your company makes. Under, of course, to do that, you need an understanding of this other stuff. What are the perspectives that drive your competitor's choices? You might call this the rational bit. People tend to try to think through the reasons for the decisions, even if the re their decisions themselves seem irrational to us and even to many in their own companies and how the competitors will actually go about making that decision, the process. We think that latter point is very important. So we want to get you inside this box. Yes, inside the box, all of you, inside the box. This is decision culture. Some people call it organizational politics, which is power, persuasion, and social networks, maybe manipulation. But really, we think it's about how decision culture, which is how people decide, how companies decide which decisions to make, how fast to make them, who should be involved, what they should focus on, how they should be prioritized, and how resources should be allocated as a result, how that culture shapes, constrains, and spurs your competitors' choices. Guess what? A lot of this you can do with secondary research. Now, this is important to some of you. We saw the questions you put forward in advance. 
because some of you said, can we do this without CI tools? Now, I don't know what you mean. If you mean software tools, no, you don't need software. If you mean CI tools as in cognitive tools, such as figuring out um, how to get hold of the right people to talk to them and get them to tell you good things, no, you're gonna have to do some of that. But the primary research that we we're going to tell you you need to do is going to be a little bit less scary than a lot of CI. Guess what? You don't need to talk to competitors directly most of the time. Maybe never. So that's really good news. All right. So our title is, How Will Your Competitor React to Things Your Company is Doing? The best part of it is your competitors may not even care. Maybe they're just not that into you. So a lot of most, the majority, according to surveys, of companies don't really take notice of what their competitors are doing. They just go ahead on their own path unless you're doing something that frightens them. If you're doing something hugely innovative, something brand new, something that scares them or threatens them, then they'll react. McKinsey, when they had studies about what will people do, they found out that usually companies will just keep on doing what they've done before in the past. Okay, companies just kind of stay on course. According to this McKinsey study, with, with uh, 1,500 people, they said, that most of them, over a third of the companies that answered, said, what will they do in the future according to um, their strategic initiative? And most of them said they'll take the next logical step in what they're doing. Some of them, almost as many, said uh, they put increased investment toward their same initiative that they've already been following. Only 15% said in this following year they would do a completely new initiative and, and go differently in places that they've not been doing things that they've not done before. And then... Uh, I just, oh, you're not done. I'm not quite done. A few of them... Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> Thank you. You're so kind. Said um, they would decrease investment in what they were already doing or there were no new strategic directions or innovations. Can you do it now? Can you do it now? Yeah, you okay. Right. So competitor responses. Once again, it's good news. The research, as Kent said, may be simple and not too scary. If, as McKinsey said, the past is prologue and the usually, companies usually. will usually keep doing the things that they're doing before. Remember, only 15% said they're going to go radically different then a lot of your research can just be done on the web and in your team's memory because, of course, people in your own company have knowledge. Your salespeople have different knowledge about your competitors than, and they, they are some of the best people, of course, to talk to because they interact with prospective customers who may have been working with your competitor before using your competitor. Anyway, going to your team, going to the employees in your company and talking to them about it is a great way of getting information. The primary research you need to do could just be within the members of your own company and boundary spanners. That's what we call people who span boundaries between one company and another. That'll be, of course, as it says, suppliers, consultants, us. trade journalists, experts. We would never leak. People who um, know both you and your competitor. Now, no. think. What competitors do you need to research? Once again, this is good news oh, week. Ooh, the really good news is you don't have to do a whole herd of people. That's exactly Not dozens, right. not scores of competitors. That's exactly right. The ones you need to do, excuse me, are the competitor that has to respond because you've done something amazing and your move threatens them. 
know what, before you even announce your move, work out what your competitor's response is going to be. And the competitor who's gaining on you and wants your market share. So if I can make a comment on that, the competitors that must respond are typically some of your most direct competitors. They're already worried that you're going to catch them. They might be slightly ahead of you. The other guys are slightly behind you and trying to catch you. So look, look ahead and look just behind and don't worry about everybody else. Yes. Um, a little example here was many years ago. It was like 15, 18 years ago. Dell was ahead of HP. Yeah. In the market enterprise sales. share. Enterprise in sales. Enterprise sales. They were going mm -hmm. wild. HP managed through extreme intelligence and wisdom. You mean they hired us? <laughs> to, to understand what Dell was doing and be able to jump ahead of them. They got the jump on them. They they took over Dell's place. So they were the competitor that was gaining on Dell and wanted their market share. Yeah, they, they kind of, they were able to figure out what Dell was about to do. So that Dell ended up, because of early warning processes, telegraphing their punches, but they didn't realize they were. And HP would wait until Dell had gotten all of their marketing plans put together. The launch was about ready to go, if you recall. And then they would launch almost the same product, but a little bit better, just ahead of the other guy. Yes. So next piece. So the guy to beat is the guy who's just ahead of you. As Kent's high school running coach used to say. Don't worry about the leader until you beat all the guys between you and the, the leader. Yes. You win by beating the winners. Yes. But they're less likely to react to you. The guy at the front of the pack won't even know you're coming until you're close. That's really true. Yeah. According to a 2008 McKinsey study, they said the competitors who are likeliest to launch and succeed with new strategic initiatives that are different from past strategies are those that are already financially ahead. So once again, you want to watch the winners. Okay. So let's talk about those winners. Um, the good news here, by the way, a lot of you on this call are people we specifically know. And so we're not surprised by the survey results. Thank you for taking the survey. I didn't say that when we started, but we appreciate you having taken the survey. Um, I was surprised by the survey results because the survey showed that a lot of the stuff that we're telling you you really need to do and which competitors you really need to analyze and how apparently you're already doing. Because they're members of SKIP and they oh, understand abs the That's it. That's it. That's it. It's not because they know us. They, they know them. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So anyway, we're impressed with you and impressed with what you're doing. So you're not exactly like what we see in the surveys. McKinsey's study, this is a McKinsey study, said that strategic planners universally say that forecasting competitor reactions is essential to all market planning. Another survey by another source says, guess what? Only one in 10 market managers, leaders, directors, et cetera, actually does that. Before they launch a new product, one in 10 says, what will the competitor do? Not all of them, but the ones that count. But the other analysis is that those who do that analysis win. So you guys, if you're already doing this analysis and doing much of the stuff we're saying, you should be winning. We want to hear if you're not. We're still doing research. I didn't say that, but a lot of what we do is research-based consulting. So we want to hear from you. Whether we ever work with you or not, we want to hear about your experiences and what you learned. It helps us to help you. Okay, a few key points. We said preliminary, so I guess this is preliminary number two, right? First, you probably already do a lot of the baseline analysis that you need to do. What do I mean by that? We're going to talk in just a few minutes, somewhat disparagingly, of traditional competitive response models. But you should still use them. 
in order to figure out fundamentally what it is that people are planning to do based on their on a projection of their past behaviors, because as Nancy said, the McKinsey study shows that that's mostly what they're likely to do in response to you or to market changes generally, but also what their capabilities are to take new steps in new directions, and then use your own analysis to figure out what they might possibly do as a result. This is called healthy suppositions. You want to build a really healthy set of assumptions, almost a stereotype, not because it's right, but because if you have something firm in your mind about what you think you're going to do, you will find that you'll be able to quickly anticipate differentiation from that. Point two, people aren't really fully rational. And guess what? Decision makers are people. So the, the decisions that people make are not based just on facts and reason, but on instinct, gut feel, and their social networks, the pressure they feel from others. That takes this last point. Company decision making is, in fact, very social. So, back to my first point on the previous slide. This is one of the sample baseline tools that we recommend you try using. You've had great success with this. We know a lot of you war gamers already use this in preparation to go into war game. We 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 propose to you that it's not enough. You've got to understand more about intent than just suppose you know that intent. But this, the standard Porter's Four Corners analysis, which looks like this template on the left and the details on the right, is how it works. The slides will be available if you want to look at it, but this is all online. There's so much of this, and it's excellent. Okay. The summary of key points number two. This is so important. You don't know how competitors think and decide unless you study how they think and decide. Many studies show that most people in a corporation look at their competitors and think, okay, if I were them, this is what I would do. I'm sure they react to the very same market forces we do, and so they will react exactly as we do. Competitors don't. Inside every company is their very own decision culture. You need to understand what makes the competitor make the choices they make. And that's analyzing it from the way they're looking at it, looking at what their shareholders, their stakeholders, their outside influences and inside influences are, which might be different from yours and which create their unique decision culture. Stories of the black box of decision culture. These are, are stories that we've come across in our times in, in very the intimately, very intimately work we've been doing through the years. Okay, this was several years ago, but there was a very large chemical company who we we talked with them, we consulted with them. There was this whole list of really obvious things, and when we mentioned something, that they could, choices they could make, strategic they options, could make, and things we couldn't figure out why they hadn't done a few years ago. And every time we mentioned them, they'd go, yeah, we really should. Uh, it's not going to work, though. And we... No one will bless it at the top because... We asked why. And they said, five years before, the company made a wonderful strategic investment. And it went so south. It was catastrophic. It almost took down that department of the company. And from then on, the leaders at the top were totally reactionary. They wouldn't listen to doing anything different except what was just right within their box. What was no more, no more strategic investments. What they sizable. really did. Yep. yep. And so there was not much we could do with them. We suggested one or two tiny things, but with a mindset like that, they couldn't go anywhere. But their competitors probably didn't understand that. The competitors were probably going there saying, using the standard four corners analysis, this is what we think they're going to do. Why don't they just go ahead and do this? Can you tell the next one? Can you tell the next one? You can tell the next one. Okay, great. Because I, I stood in the foyer when this happened at this company. This is the owner of a large 
2 billion plus consumer products company was actually an MLM, okay? Just so you can read between the lines here. Her husband, who was the co-owner, had- And the iconic founder. Had recently died, so she was in charge. She simply intuited what choices, market choices, the company needed to make. What products to launch, when, where, and how, at what price. And with the help of her three top friends, did what she wanted. Okay, we were trying to provide the market data so they can make good choices, but it wasn't needed. She had it. She knew what was necessary to be done. And as a result, I'll never forget sitting in a large forum with this particular woman. And I was sitting on the front row. There were a lot of people behind me, maybe a couple hundred of uh, senior leaders were there, and I was able to sit in. And she said, if you want to know what our customers want, talk to these three women. And I looked at three white women. The company's products were sold globally. And I wondered, what do you know? Those of you, they all came from the Southeast. What do you know about that woman in Jakarta that's using your products for the health and wellness of your, her family? What do you really understand about why she's buying and how she wants to use it? It was amazing. Go ahead. Okay, so that is a totally different decision culture. And if you didn't know that, you would really wonder why that company made the decisions they did that lost them a third of their revenue within two years. Anyway, moving on. Honda has, has part of their company culture. They have unstructured what they call Wegea meetings at the heart of all their group decision making. This means unplanned, unagendaed meetings that are called on the spur of the moment with people from all different areas in whatever department or that problem is is in. In Honda, they have the interesting company culture that everybody from the CEO to the engineers to the janitors to the salespeople, they all wear white shirts, white pants, and they have their first name embroidered in red on the shirt. Everybody looks alike, so there's no huge difference in rank in what people are wearing. So they get together and hold these meetings, and they said, because it's not a top-down company, it's it's a bottom-up as much as it is top-down, Everybody gets a say in decisions. They said, sometimes we talk about the stupidest things and it feels like a waste of time. But they said, other times we get incredible insight because everybody at every level who is looking at the problem from different directions are able to weigh in on it. And all those tensions converge. Exactly. Yep. And so they said, we make, on the whole, much better decisions because of working it that way. That's their decision culture. Kodak. Kodak, this is way back when digital photography was just on the horizon. Kodak knew it was on the we're horizon. Old. We said we were old. We did say we were old. Okay. Kodak, of course, mm -hmm. made film and cameras. Their co company culture was we take care of their people our people. And whoa, did they take care of the people who worked for Kodak. We don't fire people. They didn't fire We fired people. products. They fired products. We fire profit. And they also, um, oh, they had a whole line of household products, cleaners and band-aids and everything that was Kodak brand just for their employees so they could sell it wholesale to their employees and help their employees out. They had lots of company, bring your whole family, get together and stuff. So when digital photography was coming along, they go, oh, but if we embrace digital photography, we have to cut a lot of the people in our company who know nothing besides film and cameras. We can't do that. We won't do that. We're big enough that we'll keep digital from really happening. All of those of you with a cell phone in your pocket know what has happened with digital photography. Kodak, a little late, came to the decision that digital photography was a big thing.
they had to embrace it. They had to take it in. They had to lay off a lot of their people. But because of that, we take care of our people decision making culture, they lost huge ground and the company nearly went under. One comment about that, I ask competitors, because if they understood this, and they did, because we talked to some of them, I would ask competitors if they understood this about the decision culture of Kodak, were able to say, well, we'll choose to do X because Kodak will never follow. They did X and they won. Competitor response. You, I'm sure you work with these tools that you need. And once again, Others, as, more than these two. as Kent said, these are excellent tools, SWOT, four corners, five forces, stakeholder analysis. By the way, the analysis. survey says that SWOT is the overwhelming winner amongst the people on this call, at least of the survey takers. Which to me makes good sense. Anyway, there are many others and many of them are good. It doesn't mean your tools are broken, but if you look what all those tools do, they talk about what a company did in the past when we know that that's often a good indicator, but not always what they might achieve now or want what, to achieve what they're capable of doing for instance none of these would have shown cell phone makers if you were a cell phone maker back in the old days what 90s no 2000s yeah yeah when apple suddenly came out with the first smartphone that's what could go wrong Okay, so what's the critique that we have of traditional models? Again, we advocate using them to get a baseline, but not to rely entirely upon it. First, typical competitor response models don't look at the decision-making process itself. When should you care really about that decision process? We've just said that often it doesn't matter. These are the circumstances under which you might really want to, to sit up and take notice. If a competitor has dramatically new leadership, big new capabilities from investments or acquisitions or um, partnerships, or if they have shifted two or the two of, or more of the following, we call these the marketing strategy paradigm: what they make, how they make it, to whom they sell it, or how they sell it. That's a little different twist on the, 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 the four or five Ps, for example, but it's an important paradigm for a market uh, analysis. If they shift two of those or have these strong new capabilities or have new leadership, you've got to look at how their decisions are being made now. You may well be surprised. Please remember that in the McKinsey studies that we looked at, it also said that companies that are substantially successful and well-heeled are some of those that are most likely to make sudden changes in direction. The ones that are just stable or even struggling, strangely enough, tend to stay on the same course that they've been on in the past. That's fascinating. One of you asked, asked in the chat, by the way, can you get access to McKinsey studies? Yes. We'll take most of the questions at the end of this, but please send us an email. There's two studies we've been citing. They're a few years old, but they're very insightful. Okay, number two, team group think tends to focus on past and, and a focus on past choices and public info are basically how many of those other models are used. So people sit down together and look at the models and say, what do you think are the assumptions that the competitors leadership are making? What do you think? Uh, how would you characterize their past strategies? How would you characterize what they want to achieve now? People say, oh, this is common knowledge. This is what they want to do. This is common knowledge about what they've done. This is common knowledge about what they can do. That kills insight because you may not know. You're trying to think about them as you would think about yourself. You can't learn much about decision processes from studying decision outcomes. So much of the analysis is, again, what they've done in the past, not how they got there. And critically, full strategic intent, what they plan on doing in the future and why, critically, why they want to do it, that's underscored, is rarely found in their public pronouncements. 
Okay, so finally, a few foundational insights, and then I promise we'll get into the core of the uh, decision culture analysis very shortly. Companies are, are organic, meaning they consist of occasionally rational human beings who might use reason to support their choice. Sometimes they even reason first and then go with their gut. Companies naturally grow decision processes. By the way, that first point is also how people choose what car to buy, what clothes to wear, what restaurants to go to, everything else. They might do careful analysis and then go with their gut. Lots of studies show that just on individual choices. Companies naturally grow decision processes within their overall culture. Read Kennedy and Deal's corporate culture. Old book, good book, great book. These grow out of their overall culture and it's all about what decisions they will make because of that culture, who will be involved, how they will be involved, how fast they choose and so forth. We'll talk about some of those elements. Patterns are revealed by analysis. And you can determine what they're likely to choose to do and how they'll re allocate resources to do it. But guess what? You can't really get deep into that without doing primary research interviews. Uh oh, scary part, right? Primary research interviews. Nobody likes to do those. Everybody wants to look it up online or use some analytical tool. Maybe get AI to do it. But guess what? AI can't necessarily get you to intent because AI doesn't know what people are thinking. That comes from conversation. So that might answer the questions of another one of you. AI is very helpful for getting the baseline background. It's not very helpful here. Finally, and this is a key point, the additional insights come after analysis, scenario making, and role play. But if you just do the analysis and you don't do the scenario and role play, guess what? It's no so good. <laughs> Why is that? Because when you talk to other people about those insights, the gestalt, the upshot of all of that is that together you come up with a much deeper positioning of that company's purpose than you can do on your own. It's just much better and it leads to truly actionable if they do that. If they're capable and they want to, and the, the culture permits it, they're likely to, we should then do this. Role play includes war gaming, of course, but you don't need to war game everything or even make scenarios about everything. But you need to talk about everything and get people involved in that process. Where does the model come from? I promise we're getting to the real model. That's the next just slide. Just a minute. Okay, so we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. Some of our favorites that we've used a lot are, as you see, Kennedy and Deal, Room Yetten on group decision models, um, all these other people. Yeah, this is actually from 2019, this guy. Yes, on the use of rational, intuitive, and political decision making. Kent loves the term political decision making. I tend to think of it. Democrats and Republicans. Anyway, oh, they don't use it. There are many more <laughs> beyond these that you can use that we have used. And we have had 18 years of application on this part and have done analysis and war games and learned a lot about the way companies make decisions. So basically, we boiled down the essential elements of like 12 different models and pulled them into our framework the one that we like to use. These are the key elements in decision culture analysis. First of all, decision history, leader organization. Leader the, and organization, yeah. Yep, that. Um, the things in the yellow are the ones we're going to talk about in just the next couple of minutes. Okay, so how big the decision size is, the core group size, and their speed of choice. We worked with um, tech companies who made decisions now. Their long-term planning was for six months from now. And usually they had to move before those six months were over because tech moves so fast. And there was Honda. Well, and there was Honda who would plan for, um, they would plan 15, 20. 20 years ahead. 
Yeah. Yes, be, and try to figure out what things were going to to change. Then we worked for a steel company. Do you know how fast steel moves? Never, because it doesn't change. It just kind of sits there and has been the same for the last 50 years. And then there was only a little change before that. So speed of choice. Next is market orientation. Um, the key issues and the recipes for success we'll talk about. Strategic orientation is beyond this uh, one hour webinar. Oh, okay. The last piece here, do you want to talk about this? Oh, I was going to. Oh, okay. Go ahead, please. The next one, organizational constraints and playbooks. Um, we talked about some of this in the tribal. Well, the tribal culture is some of those stories we gave about Kodak, about Honda, about that really interesting consumer products place and such. You have to know those things. And we'll talk about some of those. Language and behavioral analysis, we're not going to get into. It's a marvelous tool. And I'm sure you will love it if it's worth your while to really go in depth. It's figuring out the, the inward brain workings of different leaders and helping to understand by who they are and how they interact with others, what it is that they will think and do. They, um, you don't do it usually by talking to any of those leaders, but rather by looking at things, a certain amount, number of things that are public knowledge. And Nancy is going to talk about this, but don't get scared. There's nine pages here. All those elements she talked about come from these nine pages, which is way out of scope for this one hour. Yes, this is um, our template, which we have put together from, as we said, all these giants who came before to be able to figure out if it's a huge decision, if there's a lot of money on the line and it's a huge and scary competitor, exactly what a company needs to know about that competitor. Right. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I should say that. Okay, and also, um, the, you know, so do you want me to talk about this? Well, uh, sure, go ahead. So typically you take, we take the template adapted to the particular case or the elements of the template, since that's what we're teaching, those five elements we talked about, and we're going to talk more than five, we're going to talk about shortly more in depth, Conduct research first internally, talking to your own team, and doing some good secondary work on what you can find on the web about the past, and then the primary to see what they're really planning and thinking now. That's critically important. From which you end up with insights that might go into a report, or you could put them in directly into a strategy or influence plans. This means not that you're usually going to in, try to influence your competitor. You can through messaging, as Porter describes, but we're really talking about something else. We're talking about using the same tool, the same process to try to persuade a key partner, prospect, or customer to make a decision you want them to make. We're not talking about that. The influence process is a different seminar, but it is tied to the same construct. Or if you're going competitively or even looking at the, the key prospect, partner, or customer, you might want to build a scenario with all of this, remember those discussions we talked about? This is where they happen. An internal workshop, no, this isn't a bid for you to hire us. You can do your own, build your own scenarios and have your own war game if you'd like, that's fine. But having the discussions that go along with that gives you the planning moxie to do it right when you do. As General Eisenhower said before he became president, that Planning is useless once it hits the heat of battle, but planning is priceless because by talking things through and planning it out, everybody knows the bigger picture and they're able to move at the time. Right. Okay. So first, this is very important to understand. And just a time check, we're at 20 minutes before the hour. We're going to leave good time for questions, but we are... Nine slides short of finishing, and we'll get done in plenty of time. So don't worry about that. Hold your questions, and we'll go through them. What are the main obstacles to profit for this company, for your target, for your competitor, to their growth? 
Again, this is what you believe, but it's better if it includes conversations that you have had with their customers, their former staff, if you can reach them, and with the boundary spanners who work with them, the other people who serve them, serve you, know them, know you. What is the difference in terms of their obstacles versus yours and what growth they're trying to get to and what gets in the way? What existential issues face this company? What problems have to be solved to enable it to continue as it is or to do what it wants to do? Existential means, though, not just what they want to do, but even keep going at all. Is there such an issue? That will consume them more than any other aspect. You need to know what it is if it exists. It might be in the mind, uh, in the eyes of the beholder. It might be an existential issue that only a few could key decision makers see and nobody else does, but you need to know that. So the next observation is that you need to understand their formal versus observed decision processes. This should, should really be processes. Because the important players in the decision process may not be known in the formal structure or shown in the formal structure. Do you want to talk about the chauffeur uh, and Samsung? Okay. And no, he's coming later. Oh, okay, he's coming later. All right, great. Yeah, this is a good story. You'll like it. Group decision size. This is fascinating. They might have a steering group of 10, 12, 15 people. I knew one with 22. But the problem is, somehow, there's this rule that says 7 plus or minus 2 is really the decision size of any core group. It's the comfortable group size. Think about your closest friends. Do you have more than nine? I mean, really close, intimate friends. Maybe if you're Bill Clinton, you can get together in Hilton Head with 200 of his closest friends. Yeah, but does anybody remember Bill Clinton? We remember Bill Clinton. Oh. Yeah, we're old. Okay, but the rule of five to nine means that probably there's no more than seven plus or minus two who really count, who's, who call the shots. Everybody else can say no in a group meeting, but they can't say yes. These Five to nine people, of course, might say no, but they're the people that can also say yes. Who are they? How do they behave? What information do they use? We'll talk about that. What is the decision process? No time to go through this. We can tell you more about it, but there's something called a process decision process, a people-based decision process, a precedent-based. You can guess what that is. Or a garbage can. Google that. Wikipedia will tell you about the garbage can decision process and some of the others. There's also one called the rational. Yes, it's there too. Does it prevail? Not frequently, but you should know it. The speed of decision making, Nancy has already addressed. Okay, recipes for success. What is it that they're driving for, towards? What does the CEO and the COO and the core staff harp on all the time in the, in the business meetings. What is acceptable to them in terms of profit in percentage or, or grow, of growth in share of market? How do they measure it? What's their target? Are they looking to grow share price or to grow, to grow earnings? Those are obviously related, but what's their target? Do they have a number? Which of these takes precedent above all others? This matters a lot. Think way back, are we old? Mm -hmm. uh, to when Wagner ran GM. You see, his key idea about um, success was market share. He said, we're going to get to 31% market share no matter what. Remember those huge rebates on GM trucks and GM vans? That's why they wanted the market share because they wanted the aftermarket parts market. That's at that time where they made a lot of money. Go for it, he said, and everything else will shake out. And a few years back, at least, I don't know if it's still the same, in Japanese text com companies, their um, definition of success was? What the Japanese tech press said was good. Mm -hmm. if, if, they, if the press loved them? It must be good. That's exactly right. Okay. All right. Every organization is a tribe, straight out of the woods, rocks or desert. This is us. Notice you can't really tell the race of these people. That's very deliberate. 
You can imagine, but you can't. Okay, all of this has to do with this tribal construct. Every tribe, if found in its natural state on some remote island or wherever, has values that they have ensconced in the legends of their heroes who personify those values and provide role models. They have rites and rituals that symbolize what's good and what's bad. They codify the good by systematically doing the rituals with each other so they can remember what to do that's good and what to avoid that's bad. They have ceremonies and symbols representing the same. And this all works together into a, a uh, shall we say, a formula for what works around here. This is how you succeed in our society. Decisions that are made contrary to the way, quote, we do things around here won't work. You might remember that a former, I won't name it, name her, she's still around, it's a her, and she later went to politics. But chief of HP tried to go contrary to this thing, whatever it is, there's different uh, uh, definitions of the HP way. She did not really succeed well because she was running contrary to the way things are done around here, contrary to the tribal concept of itself. Okay, some of the decision impacts of this tribal culture are fascinating. Values, one example of that is Southwestern for many, many years. It's wanted to be the low-cost airline. Their people would say, you know, on these longer flights, sometimes people would really appreciate a soft drink and bag of peanuts. The answer was always, does that help us to be the low-cost airline? No, we're not going to do that. You know, some people would rather have premium seats with a little more room. Does that help us? be? No, everything was main, measured against whether or not they could be the low-cost airline. Heroes. Apple had Steve Jobs, who innovated from the beginning. From his personal insight, everybody said. But we, we learned in studying Apple on behalf of a client that that wasn't entirely true. What they did was they innovated based on innovative market research and then insight. And and go ahead. I just had the to say wisdom. To, yeah, the wisdom to adapt to it and go beyond it, it. extrapolate yes. And he absolutely was their legendary hero. Rites and rituals. Um, one direct selling company would, that of course is a multi-level marketing where they have just their members go out and sell to people and build their own uh, kingdoms inside there. Yeah. They had, um, they would stop all work at their main offices once a month bring in the top direct selling team and all of their top direct selling people to honor them. And everybody in the headquarters, hundreds of them, would come there to applaud and laud these direct selling leaders. That was one of their rites and rituals that people really wanted to get to. Ceremonies and symbols. Okay. Good old Gerard Arpey. Gerard Arpey was CEO of American Airlines, and he wanted. Oh, by the way, this was post uh, 9-11, when everybody else was going bankrupt. And That's they right, and, and their airline did not. He, one day, came in really casual clothes, went to the baggage area, and started tossing bags with the other baggage people so that he could get a feel for what was going on in baggage, for what their problems were, what worked well, what he didn't know and had to learn better if he was going to work in baggage. Just like the head of Uber who recently drove for, as a driver. Yes, and learned all sorts of things by driving as a driver. Because Gerard Arpey, the CEO, did that, a lot of other leaders in American Airlines started doing that. They'd go help the the desk clerk and things like that, you know, working in different parts of the airline to understand it better from their point of view. That 
became a symbol Gerard Arpey and the rest of our leaders are not afraid of getting their hands dirty and working along with us. Next one. Our decisions made. Oh, I love this. There are several different decision-making ways of doing things. Autocratic, as our friend is here. Oh, by the way, this comes from the Vroom Yetten Group Decision Model. Uh, consultative, where the top person consults with several others. And then does what they want. <laughs> yes. Collaborative, where they all collaborate and discuss things together. Democratic, where everybody gets a vote. Consensus, where everyone has to agree before they'll move forward, which doesn't really work. Kind of a hundred things. Very. Well, yeah, that's Two true. Percent. Don't shoot us, Honda. I don't think you're on, but don't shoot us. Okay. We love you. The Chinese companies are very interesting. If any of you are in Chinese companies or have Chinese companies as some of your main competitors, if the company is a privately held company, then the leadership is almost always autocratic. The head guy, it's usually a guy, not always, uh, makes all the decisions and everybody else salutes and follows through. However, if it's a state-owned company, then they use consensus. They want everybody to talk about it and decide together so that if something goes wrong, the state comes after them. They can't just take the top guy the because everybody the else yep, has a no share fall, in no the fall guy. Too. No fall guy. Hey, knowledge culture. How do here are three really important questions? How do leaders know what they know about the market? Here is where the Samsung story comes. Oh, in. yeah, this is good. Okay, we were doing a project in which we researched the decision making of Samsung. We wanted to find out where the CEO got the information that he trusted. This was quite a few years ago so that's why we're quoting he's it. no longer ceo and it's okay he listened to his chauffeur we heard this from several people it's not as stupid as it sounds because his chauffeur also was the chauffeur for foreign dignitaries foreign and all his top brass. companies and his top brass and he could listen to what they were saying in the back seat and get an incredible vision of what was going on in the industry. So his favorite source of information was the chauffeur. What inputs did they listen to? Oh, I back to how do they know what they know? What inputs do they listen to? It might be the guys that they play, plays or she plays golf with on the golf course because all of her golf buddies are high up in other companies. It might be uh, the top people in their company. It might, if they work for Honda, be people from all walks of the whole company. And what sources are trusted? These are important things to find out to understand their decision culture. We want to give time for questions, so we're going to wrap up quickly. The next point is how willing are they to take risks or how risk averse are they? There's a lot of ways to tell about this. I think you can imagine, typically it has to do with past performance. That So again, guess what? Secondary research. But no, you also have to ask them. You have to ask people that know them, not ask them. Are they run by a Richard Branson type of person? They had a Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Galactic and all the others? A risk taker? An innovative shaker upper who takes lots of risks or Someone more conservative, like most chemical company CEOs. How does that work? Finally, we won't talk about this at all other than in passing. This is the advanced topic, language and behavioral analysis, to tell us what concepts uh, and ideas people will, or, or leaders will find, capture and retain their interest, or end up being poisoned to them, or will convince them to of their veracity and validity or motivate them to act or to retain and to retain their motivation. Capture, interest, 
convince, and motivate. That's key to persuasion, well beyond key to understanding what they might do. Guess what? That's it. We're going to talk about questions. First, just a little bit about us. We do a lot of research-driven consulting. We do research in these areas. Understand, influence, understand, anticipate, and influence, buyer mindset, futures insight, and early warning, including like early development for R&D. How does that work? How do you know to which paths to run down? And send us an email if you want to participate in our research. We'd love to hear from you. Those of you that have not taken our survey, please reach out. It's less than four minutes. Most people take it in two and a half to three. We want to hear from you. Your name and uh, your company's name will be kept private. Only reach back if you want us to. Any questions? This is it. We actually have a minute or two to do it, so let's do it. I see one that I'm going to answer right away. Somebody said, please repeat the name of the book you mentioned, Kennedy, and it was Kennedy and Deal. The book is called Corporate Culture, and it's probably 22 years old. So deal, point. like dealing a deck of cards. Correct. Other questions? The floor is open. Can you confirm the author? Uh, the author is Kennedy and Deal. Those are the two oh, authors. Gotcha. The book is called Corporate Culture. Beautiful. Corporate Culture. Okay, looks like we've got two more. How long does the process take? Well, it depends on how much of the process you do. The longest part of any of this, the longest part of the process is the primary research. If you're going to look inside your company, and then you're going to look outside the company, both, and look at the secondary to support all of that, then that can take a while. But it could also happen, depending on the size of the decision-making body on the other side and of your own team a few days. By the by, when you're doing primary, we suggest never going to the competitor themselves because um, you might end up on the wrong column of the Wall Street Journal front page. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so and so was caught spying. So go to go to the other boundary spanners. By the way, the reason for the, I'm not saying you should hire us, but if you want to talk directly to the competitor, you want to find an ethical collector to do it. It's probably not you. Mm -hmm. And there's ways to do it ethically. We can talk about that. We'll have another webinar sometime. Um, there's other questions. Yeah, Dan we've got one from Daniel Hefner. What departments in a corporation typically serves as the catalyst for this type of thinking? Daniel, the, court, the catalyst is most frequently, in our experience, honestly, either product development, product management, or sales. Or that might boil up to strategy and come out that way. But that's that's the way it would work. Uh, there's uh, There were a couple of the questions that yep, I lost. There's an anonymous question here. How is CI in other industries different from the pharma industry? It's an interesting Much question. Less aggressive. Yeah. Nobody does CI like pharma. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And the other thing about uh, CI and pharma, just, just to, to say it briefly, is the CI and pharma tends to be uh, so aggressive sometimes that it goes over the line with some collectors. Not always, but ethics is a big deal on that side because the stakes are so very high. It's, it's very tempting to move beyond the bounds that you should. That's our experience. Okay. And we have one final comment from Philip Ostroff. He just wanted to say this was very useful to see. Thanks. We'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Oh, and reach out if you want the McKinsey study and I'll send it to you. Send it, send me an email. Absolutely. I definitely want to take the time, Kent and Nancy, thank you for sharing your insights. I am confident that everyone with us today took away several useful golden nuggets, as we like to say. The recording from today will be available for you guys. And I want to thank everyone for taking their time to participate and have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Happy summer, guys. Yes. Thank, thank you. you all so much. All right. Bye, bye now. Thanks, everybody.